Hello, uh, welcome to this week's edition of Tax at 10. I'm Rachel D'Souza and with me as always is Andrew Robbins. Today we're going to talk about hypothecated taxes. But before we get into that, I think we've actually got to explain what we mean by that, don't we, Andrew? Can you give us a summary of what we mean by hypothecated taxes? Hypothecation basically is just the, the posh way of saying allocated. So a hypothecated tax is one that's being allocated for a specific purpose. Uh, national insurance was hypothecated. It was introduced as a tax in the 1940s designed specifically to pay for work-related benefits such as pensions and unemployment payments. More recently, uh, weirdly, landfill tax is a hypothecated tax. Mm, so it's just one I knew about. Well, there you are, you see. When it comes to pieces of useless information, <laughs> I am a world leader. So the idea behind a hypothecated tax basically is you raise a specific sum of money for a specific purpose. So Rachel, why do you want to talk about hypothecated taxes today? Well, it came to my mind um, partly because there's been a new proposal um, that social care should be um, paid for in the future by a specific levy on the people who are over the age of 40. And of course, that would be um, a very good example of a modern hypothecated tax. So the idea being that there is an additional tax charge, which I, if I've understood correctly, um, there's a suggestion that ultimately it, it might need to be as high as 4% tax charge on the general public, applying to anybody who's over 40 to provide enough additional money to the government to properly fund social care for the whatever age you, you decide yeah. it draws in from. That is the broad idea, although my understanding was also that because of the extreme cost of, of social care in order to fund it properly, there would probably need to be some um, further help from the general taxation pot. But anyway, but it, it is very much, as you say, it's designed to be paid by the people who are closer to the age of having to make use of that type of um, a governmental service. So if we say that we kind of understand what it is, perhaps we should look about whether we think it's a good thing or a bad thing. I guess it's certainly an easier sell in some ways, isn't it? If you ask most of us, do we think it's a good idea for the government to pay for people's social care when they're elderly so that they can continue to live at home and have a decent standard of life? You'd have to be pretty hard hearted to say, no, I don't think that's a good thing. Mm. The problem, of course, has always been paying for it. So it mm. seems a fairly natural progression to go from. It's one of those um, public survey things where you you lead people down the road. If you start by saying, do you think social care is a good thing? Do you agree the government should spend more money on it? <laughs> it's then quite difficult to say, do you agree that your taxes should be raised in order to pay for that? You can't really yes. turn around and say, I think it's a good thing. I think we should pay mm -hmm. for it, but I don't think I should be the one paying. So, hypothecation. So, it's the, the NIMBY argument. So, not yeah. in my backyard type thing. Yeah. It becomes quite difficult if you're saying, actually, I'm all in favour of the government paying more for social care, but I'm opposed to it being paid out of my taxes. You're be, you become a bit hypocritical. I guess the, the big upside for me is if you want to raise a lot of money to pay for social care, putting it into a separate pot where it's only used for that purpose makes it very clear that's what you're doing, makes it easier for me to put my hand in my pocket because I can see it's going to support the thing that I've agreed I like. And presumably it makes it easier for the politicians to sell the idea to the general public. I think so. Um, it just it just shows that you're not just going to use the money in other ways that I might not support as much. 
it because you've ring fenced it but therein lies the problem does it not um will the fund or will the taxes that are raised from the hypothecated tax be be actually ring fenced and used for the purpose that they are originally designed for well that's that's very cynical and i have to say normally that's my line me? cynical <laughs> but, but you've got to think haven't you that um you know the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions you start off with a hypothecated tax with a big pot of money which is being used for one purpose and a few years down the line times are hard and the chancellor is is looking at how do i fund my new road building program oh mm. look there's a bigger big pot of money over there and of course that's really what happened with national insurance isn't it if we go back in history when national insurance was brought in in what the probably the 1940s it was a separate or separately designed for um the specific purpose but nowadays it just forms part of general taxation pot absolutely i think there's also a, a worry there about how far you go as mm -hmm. you know i'm um something of a logical thinker and so to my mind if you start with hypothecation in one area where do you draw the line how do you rationally conclude that it's appropriate for social care but it's not appropriate when it comes to i don't know paying for libraries or paying for the armed services or mm -hmm. prison reform or uh, international aid and some of those things would be a lot easier to hypothecate than others i don't have children does that mean i'm less likely to be willing to pay money towards education i would hope not but you could see human nature kicking in i'm a well, big there has to be an argument there if you don't have children you might be saying well why would i want to be um having part of my taxes put towards their education for example and you get to a very dangerous position it seems to me you might say this is just democracy in action and actually allowing people to vote on the minutiae of where their taxes go is transparent and is a good thing but isn't that what they do in switzerland i guess to an extent it is isn't it mm, i think um, they do but it does mean that you end up with a government that is so fractured that it makes it very different difficult to control okay so so we think there's some upside we think there's some downside is there a middle ground is there is there a place for some kind of hypothecation i can see that there is a place for um for limited use of hypothecated taxes but I think if you go, as you say, if you go too far, it just makes the general tax system unworkable um, and just could not, you know, we couldn't function in that way. I think you're right. So if it does pump more money into the system to pay for something that I think we all agree we desperately need, it may be an imperfect solution, but it's better than no solution at all. Yeah, and as I say, I mean, I think it's going to have its place but big, big concern that the pot won't stay segregated for the long term. And then we're just back to square one. Mm. Anyway, on that note, um, what about a bit of light relief? What have you got to share with us this week? Right. I want to highly recommend uh, Natalie Haynes. Natalie Haynes is... Well, originally she was a stand-up comedian. She still does some stand-up comedy, but she's a classicist. So she's a novelist, she's a critic, she's a writer about the Greek and Roman world. Um, you, I'm sure, will be able to find on YouTube uh, things like she's just finished a tour where she did the whole 24 books of the Iliad in the course of 30 minutes. And it's, it's just brilliant. She's very clever. <laughs> she's very funny. And she talks about ancient Greece. So really, what's not to love? We hope you enjoyed this week's session. 
You can contact us by email and that's rachel.dsouza at rsmuk.com or andrew.robbins at rsmuk.com. We will be delighted to receive comments or feedback that you have. Thanks for now and goodbye. Bye everybody.